start recording. K recording has been started now, so we'll try to keep our swearing to a minimum. <laughs> All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint presentation? I can, yeah. Do you guys get the full screen version or do you get the version with all my little slides on the side? Yeah, I can see all the slides on the side there. I guess it doesn't really matter. No, I, I, you can still okay, see Okay, so speed forward control. Uh, carrying off from third year uh, advanced process control, feed forward control. Uh, the best thing I can say about feed forward control uh, right off the giddy up though is that it's quite similar to cascade in that its purpose is to react to a disturbance before it affects our primary variable. So it's it's similar to cascade, uh, only it's a little bit more direct. And we'll kind of look at that as we go forward here. Okay, so our objectives here are to describe the differences between a feed forward control loop and a feed back control loop. And hopefully we remember that a feedback control loop uh, responds to a difference between the uh, process variable and our set point. And when we get an error, that error is fed back into the system and then we can uh, apply a, an opposite value to it to try to bring it back in line. Feed forward uh, is different in that it takes a measurement of the variables of a process and we'll compare them before the process variable is affected. Um, and we'll look at how that works out. Okay, so feed forward control reacts to prevent a disturbance from affecting the controlled variable rather than reacting after the disturbance occurs. And in this regard, it is very similar uh, to the definition of cascade control. If you remember, uh, cascade control was one controller uh, its output was acting as a set point to a second controller uh, on a loop where the disturbance, uh, and then the examples from third year, if you remember, was usually a steam disturbance. And the idea was if we can detect the steam disturbance before it changes the heat in the exchanger and then the ultimate process variable, we can keep our process more in line. And feed forward is very similar to that. Um, but it is a little bit more direct. Uh, we'll talk about uh, detecting on a uh, load disturbance on uh, the feed, oh sorry, I guess this diagram on the feed into the exchanger rather than on the manipulated variable in this case. So it's more of a load disturbance reaction than it is uh, a manipulated variable disturbance reaction. So just to go over some key features here, uh, just to get you back in the groove here, manipulated variable in this diagram, which was very common in third year. Uh, the manipulated variable here is the steam flow. We manipulate that steam flow in order to control the temperature of our exchanger, which in turn uh, controls the heating rate of our process. Controlled variable here in this case is the cool fluid, hot fluid. Uh, process here. So the temperature of the hot fluid leaving the exchanger would be our controlled variable. And we look at different disturbances, which could be a disturbance in the steam flow, a disturbance in the rate at which we feed our uh, cool fluid in. And also it says here things external, such as environmental temperature, um, which on a day like today, for example, where it's cold and the wind is really blowing, will strip a lot of heat out of the process. So these are all the different types of disturbances that we're looking to mitigate with these advanced type of strategies. Okay, so we're looking at feedback control first and how feedback control reacts to a disturbance and then we'll compare that to feed forward and you can see uh, the distinctions and the benefits that we get by using feed forward over feedback control. And remember, feedback, we don't know anything has happened until it has happened, whereas feed forward, we have, uh, we have an idea ahead of time. Okay, so feedback control, again, responds when a disturbance causes the process variable to deviate from the set point. So your uh, PV minus SP or SP minus PV giving us an error and telling us whether we have a direct or reverse reaction to that disturbance. 
For slow processes, feedback control may cause the control process variable to deviate substantially from its set point. Or what that really means is we could get large overshoots. If something happens, it's not detected uh, quickly enough, or the dynamics of the process do not allow it to react quickly enough, we can end up with large overshoots, such as you would see here. We had some type of a disturbance. Our controller reacted in a dramatic way, which caused our process variable to react uh, in a dramatic way as well. And it's this variation between our uh, set point and where the PV is going that we're concerned with here. The idea between feedback control, as we see here, and feed forward control is to try to straighten out this line on our process variable and make the difference or error smaller. We look first here at pure feed forward control. And like many things we did in third year, we kind of start out with the baby step or the primitive version of the control. And then we add the different elements into it until we get the full developed feed forward uh, control scheme. And each step we take gets a little bit better. So here we look at pure feed forward control where the disturbances are measured and they are used to determine the value of the manipulated variable. So here in this case, we're feeding in a product into the exchanger, we can call it oil or milk or whatever it happens to be, but we're measuring the temperature and the flow of that product prior to it going into the exchanger. So we know that if we have a hotter feed product or a colder feed product, we know it right away. Whereas in the previous examples, we'd have the transmitter on the discharge line and we wouldn't know until after it had gone through the cycle. So with pure, pure feed forward here, it's not possible uh, to get it exactly perfect. Um, and as a result, we usually end up with something uh, with the offset. And the offset is indicated here, although slight in this graph uh, between these two lines here. So pure feed forward is going to provide us with a good response, but it is also going to have some offset. So that's why we don't have uh, pure feed forward loops. We will build on that. And the reason we're building on it is to try to eliminate that offset to complement the improved process variable response. You can see there's a lot of mechanisms and a lot of different things that are going on uh, in a feed forward loop. Um, and it doesn't get any uh, more complicated in terms of hardware, but we'll, we'll figure out how all of this stuff affects everything here. Okay, feed forward and feedback control. Uh, you can see here we've added another transmitter on the discharge side of our product line here, which is our feedback. Remember after the fact that this happened, so we're feeding it back into the system. The disturbance are still being measured by the flow transmitter and temperature transmitter uh, TT and FT200 right here. Those values are being fed into the manipulated variable in order to mitigate, again, the amount of offset that we get or the amount of um, variation that we get in the response from the process variable here. What we do gain by adding the feedback component to this is, as you can see in the diagram, the elimination of that off offset that we had when we were strictly um, feed forward. We will not pause for this. Uh, next objective here, describe the advantages and applications for feed forward control. So things get a little bit tricky here. Uh, I'll boil this down for you. There's lots of reading in the ILM that you'll figure it out. But the long and short story um, from pages four to about page eight, they talk about st uh, static and dynamic feed forward responses. And uh, the difference really comes down to a timed response and a non-timed response. So non-timed response is essentially a step response as we see here versus a um, dynamic type response here, which has a T1 component. And this is where we start reintroducing some of the terms and things that we learned in third year, where we calculate our dead time, our T1 time, and our gains uh, based on change in output over input and other variables. So hopefully you guys can remember some of that stuff because it plays in to the calculations that we need to do for uh, determining the values for tuning 
a feed forward type process. So stat static versus dynamic feed forward responses. Easiest way to identify them is the uh, lack or presence of a timed response. And a timed response results in a slope, and a not timed response re uh, results in a, an immediate step from the controller. So that's long story short when we're talking about static and dynamic responses. Feed forward compensation. In order to uh, make feed forward work, we have to experimentally determine transfer functions of the process and the disturbances in order to develop these control strategies. And this is why I say we are going to be falling back on some of the stuff from third year and hopefully you remember your place uh, equations and how we calculate the different uh, process transfer functions based on the, the test values that we get from graphs. So it does come down to that again. So if you thought that you were over it, uh, you're not. Good news is, uh, big math, as we see here on the bottom of this slide, which is probably pretty unfamiliar, but again, boils down for us into a pretty straightforward uh, calculation over here. So just to review our Laplace transfer function uh, terminology here, our, our uh, overall gain is a result of the gain of the process represented by K, our dead time, which is represented by TD, and our T1 time, which is represented by T1S. We will end up with the uh, Laplace transfer function equation for both a load disturbance as well as for uh, process um, and they're related to each other in this wonderful mathematical formula over here that gets boiled down to this marvelous little one that we use over here. In this case GL is the transfer function of the load disturbance and GP is the transfer function of the plant. So this is a very important formula for us to remember right here, negative GL over GP. There is one example of math in the back of the ILM for you to do. Um, it's kind of fill in the blanks. I have the slides that we will review uh, going over it, but by and large, uh, this ILM is mostly just wrapping your head around the, the concepts of feed forward control and how it's different from other mechanisms that we've looked at earlier. So moving into a dynamic feed forward control strategy here as we progress from uh, straight feed forward, we move to a dynamic control strategy here and this is on page 12. And you'll see a bunch of all different variables going on here. We have our feedback component over here. We have a feed forward device over here. Um, and then we have our manipulated device over here. What we see within this flow transmitter here are a bunch of flow computers that are applying the math values that we calculate using our transfer functions. You'll see uh, DT here for dead time, uh, lead lag over here, uh, gain, and my eyes are bad, I can't read what this one is, but these are all the functions that we have to calculate in order to compensate for the feed forward strategy. They come from the transfer functions being, uh, and the loop tests that we do just like we did in third year, uh, and we'll see how that works in the next next slides here. So we'll do uh, basically step tests for low disturbance and step tests for the process that will give us a graph. From the graph, we'll do all our calculations, your 63.2% times the overall gain and your output over input, and you'll get values to create transfer functions for the process and for the load disturbance. And then we'll apply uh, this magical formula to it and a couple of other little formulas and that will give us the numbers that we need for tuning that get put into the uh, computer. Okay, so here's a flashback for you all. Um, this is the example from the ILM. So just to review, we make a step change in our controller output of some value, in this case 10%. Our process variable reacts in a certain way. So in this case, we did a 10% change on our controller. We got a 19% change on our process variable. If you remember, change in output over change in input will give us our gain. 
And again, this is for the plant, so pay attention here. Plant transfer function, we'll also do one for a load uh, in the following slide. So this is review from third year. So from the values of this graph, we can get our KP, which is output over input, which is 1.9. We can get our T1 time, which is 63.2 times our 19% change in their PV, which gives us 12. And we get our dead time, which is the time from when our controller output step was made to when our tangent line crosses that median line. I hope this is familiar. Uh, hope this is all familiar to you. So from this graph, we can then determine our transfer function. In this case, our K 1.9. Our dead time is three, uh, three times five minutes. Remember, be be very wary of what units are in these squares. Sometimes it's one minute, sometimes it's two minutes. Uh, in this case, the first time I've seen this, but five minutes. Uh, and then our dead, or sorry, our T1 time, which is down here, which is eight. And hopefully uh, you guys remember how to do that. So that's our plant transfer function. So that's part of our formula that we had on the previous uh, slide there, our negative uh, GP over GL formula, this guy right here, sorry, negative GL over GP. So we found this part. Now we have to do the disturbance transfer function, same test, same process um, in order to get all those variables again. So uh, controller output uh, or load disturbance in this case, not a controller output change. In this case, we would be changing the flow of the fluid going into our exchanger here. So Q uh, MP here, which would be tied to, whoops, will be tied to the value of change that we make in the feed of this product right here. Okay, so we change that feed rate a little bit. It causes a reaction in our process variable. We go about finding our variable uh, variables for our transfer function the same way we did with the plant. So output over input in this case, um, minus four over 5%, giving us a negative gain value and be aware of that. You can see a step change here. Uh, increase in flow gives us a decrease. So that tells us a reverse acting. So make sure you look for negative variable in your gain. And then finding out our T1 time is uh, same process as before. So now we have our GL variables here. Wonderful, right? Good. So let's look at the math question in the back of the ILM right now so we can work through this together. Um, that will eliminate you having to email me probably later. So if you want to turn to the back of your ILM to the self-test question, uh, we can kind of work through that together so that we get it all straightened out. Because looking at this is probably very confusing, but this is essentially what we figured out. We figured out the transfer function for our load disturbance. We figured out a transfer function for our plant excuse me, which is compiled of all of this wonderful stuff. And we have to figure out these variables in order to come up with, uh, come up with numbers to put into our um, control system to compensate for the feed forward component. One note here that you'll see um, in this block says, if the dead time of the process is larger than the dead time of disturbance, the dead time parameter is zero. And I'll speak to that in the next slide. So let's put this together here. Page, oh, goodness, what page is that? Page 44. So the question says, determine the parameters required to implement a dynamic feed forward compensation control strategy from the following transfer function. So they've done uh, the fun part for us, so good news for you is you don't have to t take a graph and figure this all out. They've given us the uh, transfer functions for these, but we have to find out what is the static gain value, the lead time value, the lag time value, and the dead time value that we are going to put into the uh, DCS system or the PLC system into the control block. Ooh, does that sound like a question? I can't see that. Hang on, let's see what I can do. Uh, it's, uh, it's me there, Tyler. I'm just wondering, we're on the feed forward control module. Is that right? Yes, sir. 
401 401c no i've been watching along there but uh you said on page 44 the question you're going on about it's 42. Uh, okay i mean i'm using version 22 of the ilm i'm not sure what version you have so our pages might not match out correctly okay uh, but i have it as question i have it as question number eight in the ilm it's the only math question oh okay yeah i'm on question eight page 42. what version are you running there on the, uh, on the back cover at the bottom it should tell you what version number you are uh 23. oh my god a new version already <laughs> I, I just got this version two weeks ago oh really i got mine uh probably a month ago oh well lucky me i got a little stock i got that's right anyway there shouldn't be enough difference that we have to worry about it okay so back to that question number eight here so these are the values off of question number eight so i boiled this out to you um how you do this question if you're interested you might want to just put a note beside the question in the self-test uh, the procedure for doing this is on page 14 or so of the ilm so if you have any questions about it um, that's where you'll refer to it but i'm trying to put this slide in here to kind of kind of make it easier for us um, but we're essentially doing these three steps right here in order to find out our gain, our lead time, uh, and our dead time and our lag time so that we can put them into the feed forward block of our control system. So uh, simple, and if you wanna write these down, it might be easier to do this here, but um, our static gain setting is going to be our KL over our KP. So from the example given on page 42 or 44 for question number eight, we see our GL K value is 1.2. Our GP K value is 1.6. So KL over KP is 1.2 over 1.6, which gives us a negative 0.75 value for a static gain setting. So that would be the answer for the static gain. The lead time setting is simply the T1P time. And this is just a memory thing for you guys. Uh, you'll just have to remember that lead time is the process t1 time and lag time is the disturbance uh, setting so looking at the laplace equations here t1p is 7s so that's where we get that value from t1l is 9s that's where we get that value from and in order to find our dead time we take the dead time value from our load disturbance and subtract our dead time value from our process disturbance. This is where you are going to identify that note block here, which says that the process dead time is larger than the disturbance dead time. That is an important thing for you to remember. So if we look in this case, our load disturbance dead time is 1.8. Our process dead time is 1.4. So it is not greater than the load disturbance so we are going to use whatever value that we calculate. In this case, 1.8 minus 1.4 is 0.4, which is going to be our dead time setting. If this value, 1.4, was 2.0, for example, our dead time value would be set to zero. And that's what I'm trying to capture uh, in this statement here. Very important. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So that's that's the math um it's not particularly tricky if you can remember your third year stuff uh, from the graphs uh, that will rear its head again in the future as we look at some of these other uh, advanced control strategies as we move forward in the course um, this stuff here is basically uh, memorization or, or or understanding how feed forward works this is where we get those values so we have now calculated the values from process tests and again these are process tests we have to uh, we have to upset the system or, or do some type of uh, testing in order to get our transfer functions <clears throat> so if we look at the comparison uh, between straight feed uh, feedback dynamic feed forward and static feed forward 
this is really designed to just show you the, the benefits um, of, the, of the systems as we advance into these more complicated strategies. So feedback down here on the lower right, we have a disturbance, our controller reacts, it overshoots a little bit, as does our process variable. And in a feedback loop here, based on that disturbance upset, we've got a deviation of about 2.6%, which isn't significant, but it can be better. So we go to a static feed forward compensation. And in this case, we get the same load disturbance, but you'll notice that our controller disturbance is uh, immediate and static can be identified again by the fact that there's no curve here. It's an immediate response with a vertical line. And we get still some deviation, but not as bad as with straight feedback, deviation of about 1.3%. Now with the dynamic feed forward, same load disturbance. Uh, why is this not showing that? I'm not gonna get into it, but let's uh, say that with the dynamic feed forward compensation, our maximum deviation has been reduced significantly from where it was with pure feedback. So this is ultimately the purpose between feedback and feed forward is to mitigate the amount of deviation on our process variable that is caused by a load disturbance. And I hope that's straightforward enough for you. I'm almost thinking that this graph might be wrong, but I think I, whatever, it's not important at this point in time. Okay, the major point here is the whole idea behind feed forward is to mitigate the amount of discrepancy between our process variable and our set point. Uh, da, 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 da. So when we look at a nonlinear process, and this is a this is a graph that shows the result of a nonlinear uh, process to feed forward compensation. And the nonlinear process affects the performance of feed forward compensation because it is based on experimentally derived transfer functions for one set of load conditions. And those of you who can still recall from third year, when we tune a loop, we generally tune it for a specific operating range, that operating range in which we normally would expect to operate. Within that range, we will generally get a much better response out of it as we'd see here. When we're outside of that range, we are prone to getting deviations that are above what we would normally get. And that is simply a result of the transfer function changing throughout the op operating range of a nonlinear process. And if you recall uh, from third year, when we had a linear process, we had a nice straight line going across the graph. And if we did a rise over run calculation at any point along that line, we would get the exact same values. Whereas a nonlinear one that curves, we could end up with different gain values at different points. And this is illustrating that fact. So this one is messed up because it is outside the range for which it was tuned and it is nonlinear. So just be aware when you're, when you're tuning any process, uh, it may not respond the way you want it to in a range outside of what you uh, set it up for. Okay, moving into uh, a model predictive control strategy here. And we'll look at a model predictive control strategy versus a, uh, sorry, dynamic model predictive control strategy. And we'll, uh, we'll differentiate that here in a second. So model predictive feed forward uses mathematical model developed from mass or energy balance equations. The definition here is more important than really the whole other, uh, anything else I'm gonna say about it. The differentiation between model predictive and the dynamic model is the dynamic model, we do graphs like we had just done Whereas the model predictive, we rely on some fancy math. Uh, the fancy math generally beyond the scope of our trade education and more along the lines of engineering math. And you'll see in the next slide that the math is pretty intense. Uh, we don't do it, but that math is directly related to mass or energy balance equations. And mass and energy balance equations are typically wrapped up inside of 
uh, boilers and steam uh, situations. Okay, so model predictive from mass or energy balance equations. And, and here's what it looks like in an old block diagram, but here's what it looks like in a, in a math diagram. So <clears throat> okay, so very complicated, all kinds of wonderful things that we have to calculate, usually above our pay grade. We're not too worried about it, but do understand that model predictive relies on this mass energy balance math. Uh, no, 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 no. So we don't have to worry about any of this kind of math. So this is just for uh, information purposes for you guys here. Static model predictive feed forward control strategy. Performance is not compromised at different process load conditions because of nonlinearity. So that's an important thing uh, to associate with this model predictive strategy. Okay, moving on to the dynamic model here, and this is um, basically what we did in the math that we do in our in our uh, trade, or at least in this class, where we determine the parameters for lead and lag and dead time, which are determined through the experimental data, which results in the transfer functions that we end up using. So we do our tests, we get our transfer functions, and from that we can determine our lead lag and dead time values. Okay, uh, again, this uh, these blocks here, LL for lead and lag time, DT for dead time, not critically important, but worth noting because they are the uh, functions that are associated with feed forward control. Okay, where do we use feed forward control? Just like cascade control, we tend to use these on slow processes which are subject to frequent large disturbances, such as temperature changes or large level uh, changes, levels with large capacities, and processes with a dynamic inverse response. Does anybody out there remember what example was given for a process with a dynamic inverse response? Five, four, Three, two, one. No takers. So it was the steam drum level. I remember we talked about the steam drum level in third year when there was a high demand for steam. The steam flowed out of the drum, which caused a decrease in pressure, which allowed the liquid in the drum to expand, creating a false higher level. And then as the steam pressure increased again, the pressure pushed the drum level back down again. So that was the dynamic inverse response example that we had from third year. And lucky for you, it's the same example that we use in fourth year. So this is where we use uh, feed forward. So similar processes that we would use for cascade. Okay, feed forward should not be used for processes that are easily controlled using feedback control. And that's kind of a no-brainer. Don't things don't make things more complicated than they need to be. Okay, here's an example uh, of a distillation process. Uh, it has both a large capacity and temperature. So a prime example for a feed-forward control system. Here we have two reboilers, uh, one on the steam and one that uses saturated vapor. So again, both temperature components here, both capacity components here, uh, size of the exchanger uh, comes into play. So saturated uh, vapor steam uh, frequently fluctuates, producing disturbances to the heating process. So that falls in line with our definition of frequent and large disturbances. So if I ask you for a good example of a process that would benefit from feed forward distillation is probably a great answer for that. Okay, boiler level feed forward control. This is the dynamic inverse response example that we looked at in third year that we're going to look at again here. 
Uh, the terms, if you don't recall from third year, were shrink and swell. And this goes on with the increased steam demand here. We take start taking steam, we get a pressure decrease that allows our uh, liquid to expand. And then when the steam demand decreases, our pressure will increase, causing the pressure inside to push the water molecules closer together, calling, uh, causing what we call shrink. So if we can determine uh, the steam demand ahead of time, we can compensate for we can compensate for that in the steam drum. Okay, block diagrams, just like third year block diagrams were a, a thing. So here's a block diagram of a feedback controller with some compensation here. And then we have our feedback compensation and we have our load disturbance being measured here as well. So we'll get an error generated by the difference between set point and process variable. And we'll have possibly an error introduced by a load disturbance. They are combined together in this compensation. And that variable is fed back through the transmitter. Again, feedback to reduce that uh, offset that would be present if we had straight up feed forward control. Okay, adding feed forward compensation to this is done by using this feed forward controller and the new parameter that we figured out uh, through our, our map there, the difference in the gain of the load disturbance and the gain of the process. So ultimately what we're doing when we're implementing a feed forward process is we're uh, addressing uh, the effect of the load disturbance on the process. And in order to do that, we, we do a test of each process to see how it reacts. And then we make a ratio or basically take, oops, basically taking a dividing line here and we're providing a ratio that gets applied to our controller output. So this is the key block in a feed forward compensation block. So feedback controller, you see we're missing that block. Feed forward, we have this block. Okay, scaling block. Uh, ideally, scaling adds nothing to the control signal when the flow is at normal conditions. And there's all kinds of uh, wonderful math that's involved here. in here. We don't have any of this in the self-test, so I'm not going to dwell on it very much. But scaling uh, is is just scaling, right? We're trying to change this, in this case, from uh, liters per minute into kilograms per minute. You've, you've done this before. Uh, it's input-output formula in all intents and purposes. It's input-output formula. So nothing, uh, nothing there that I'm going to drill you guys on. This is all more about block diagrams. Model predictive here, this block diagram uses some fancy internal math. And again, not really looking to drill you guys too hard on this. Uh, this is above our pay grade as far as I'm concerned, but the idea here is that you can kind of identify the differences between a, a, a feedback style block diagram, a feed forward controlled, Style, uh, feedback and feed forward type controller and some of these other type of block diagrams but don't dwell on these uh, too much nothing here that we're really going to be testing you on uh, this is more uh, engineering level stuff okay but internal calculations are being done inside the feed forward feedback controller we don't have to worry about this this is this is simplified for us into uh, this type of a diagram. Okay, wonderful. More uh, funky math. I'm, I really should probably just delete these slides. Uh, they probably complicate things more than they need to for our purposes here. 
but put in place here just to illustrate what is in fact going on inside the controller. Okay, programming requirements. Lots of things here you'll find similar to things we talked about in third year. So general programming for all forward, forward control strategies must provide the ability to control the process in manual, just as any other process. We can't just run it in automatic. We have uh, shutdown startup situations where we have to run things in manual. We want to have bumpless transfer. When we switch between auto and manual, we want to make sure that we don't have process upsets. And if you remember from third year, uh, the function that, uh, or the result of that is called bumpless transfer. And we get bumpless transfer by feeding the controller output um, back to the auto and manual modes so that when we switch between them, they're already at the same bias setting. We also want the ability to control with or without feed forward. So just like we can switch cascade on and off, we can switch feed forward on and off. We also want bumpless transfer when switching between feed forward and regular feedback control. So pretty standard, straightforward uh, in terms of the options that we want with any type of control scheme. We want to be able to control in auto and in manual, and we want to have bumpless transfer when we're switching from auto or manual or taking it in service and out of service, or when we're switching between modes, cascade or feed forward or feedback, etc. Methods for tuning. So again, this is more of uh, a process uh, than anything. Um, is this worth committing to memory? I guess for testing purposes it is, um, but they are relatively standard across um, different control schemes, whether it's a straight up feedback loop or it's a cascade loop or a selective loop. Um, they all have their procedures, but they're usually pretty similar. So let's see how similar they are to things that you may or may not remember from third year. Okay, ideally low disturbance should not result in deviation of the process variable from the current value. That's our ultimate goal. Um, of course, if that, they do happen. Low disturbances that are not measured or feed forward compensation that is not perfect requires the feedback controller to bring the process variable, sorry, the process variable back to set point. We call this feedback trim. That's the component that removes the offset that feed forward would have if it was straight pure feed forward. So in order to tune it, we're going to have to obviously get that feedback loop involved as well. So let's see how that looks. Okay, uh, we use transfer functions to determine the initial values for the static, static and dynamic feed forward control parameters. We've done this exercise already. So once we've done our testing, we get our uh, transfer functions and then we do our uh, little K, negative KL over KP math and um, our get our T1 times and our uh, difference in our dead times, we can get our values to put into the controller. First, we have to go through the process. So before we start, we put the process at normal conditions we put our feedback trim in manual with the output set to produce a normal set point. So basically what they're saying is put it in manual and let it get happy. <clears throat> Disable the dynamic compensation by programming the lead time and lag time to a value of one and the dead time to a value of zero. So without doing this several times, you're probably you know, not going to remember that. The good thing is, is that you can always refer to the old interweb and uh, recover this stuff. But for exam purposes here, um, when setting up here, lead and leg time set to one, dead time set to zero, and then program experimentally with a determined static gain and, and enable the feed forward signal. These are just words. I understand that it's not really doing anything 
by me reading this to you, but there would be six pages for you to read and you might not understand what you need to take away from it. So this is kind of the stuff that's important to me that you take away from this. So we start out with a number of for static gain. We punch it in there. How do we know what's going on? We try it, we do a little test. The static gain is too high, too high. We can tell because the PV decreases and then recovers above or the PV increases and recovers below the original value. That's one way to find out. If the static gain is too low, we will see that the PV decreases and recovers below the set point or the PV increases and recovers above the original set point. I'm trying to make uh, I'm trying to make this easier for you to determine what types of things I might test you on. There's lots of it in here, so I don't want you to be going, well, yeah, I can pick anything and I've never seen this before. So the point being here is that you have seen it, thereby it is fair game. Okay, uh, here's, a, here's a couple of diagrams that illustrate what happens when we talk about the lead leg function block. And remember the lead leg parameter is LL, which means that they're basically compared to each other. And these graphs represent what happens uh, in the relationship between lead and leg. Okay, so when the lead is less than the leg, and you can do that mathematically here, we end up with a graph that looks like a first order response. Okay, when the lead is greater than the lag, we get what looks like a derivative set point kick type response, and then a, a reverse acting curve. And when the lead is equal to the lag, we get basically what is a static response with no time. I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time elaborating on the causes for this um, because it's a lot easier for you to just associate the graph with the situation. So lead less than leg, you get this. Lead greater than leg, you get this. And lead equals leg, you get this. And I'm not going to drill any deeper than that. Do read it and do understand what's going on there if you can, but I'm not going to drill you too hard on it. Oh, goodness. Again, uh, mentioning this just because there's a lot of reading in there, um, but long story short, tune the lead leg function block before the dead time and only use the lead leg function block when the lead to leg ratio is greater than 1.3 or less than 0.65. We're going to program it with the experimentally determined lead and leg times. And how we know if we're getting things right is if a load change results in an equal response above and below the set point. And this yellow here indicates that this would be a self-test question in the back of the ILM probably. And what we mean by equal is this amount of uh, integrated error is both the same in uh, magnitude and in uh, total integration. So same size bump on the bottom as it is on the top. Okay, then we're going to program the dead time block with the difference between the load disturbance dead time and the process dead time. That's the calculation that we did earlier. If that load disturbance dead time is less than the process dead time, set to zero. Remember, we talked about that. This is the third time I've mentioned that, so make sure you wrap your brain around that. If the feed forward response waits too long, shorten the dead time. If it reacts too quickly, lengthen the dead time. Hard to remember this, I understand, but it's part of our job. Okay, feedback tuning. So the feedback loop, tune normally with dynamic and static feed forward enabled, and if cascades involved, have that loop in cascade as well. Feedback is the, uh, I believe the last thing that we tune. I can't remember now. Yeah, feedback is the last thing that we tune. 
which means that all the other elements that we've previously tuned must be in play in order for the loop to function properly when we are done. So when we're tuning, we start out with the static feed forward, then we do the dynamic feed forward, and then we do the feedback tuning. So it's a very elaborate tuning process, um, but we try to keep it to uh, try to keep the depth of this um, kind of tied to the self-test questions in the back because there's so much information in the ILM that if you had to read it all, you'd get even farther lost than you probably are now. Oh, again, this is kind of more repetitive and I don't know if this really does me or you any good to have me reading this off to you, um, but I've kind of boiled down what the uh, ILM goes over in four or five pages. So just like before, before you start, you want the process to be at normal conditions. Uh, we want our, our feedback loop to be in manual uh, and at a happy, happy spot. Um, if we have a cascade loop, uh, we have it in cascade and we want to have that dynamic compensation uh, set at one and dead time is zero, just as we had before. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so again, basically start out with everything in steady state. Lead and lag time values at one, dead time value of zero. Then we'll enter the value of the constants that we've calculated because this is model predictive. So we've done some math in order to calculate these things and we'll enter them uh, in there. Okay, if needed, adjust the appropriate constant to bring the PV to match the set point. So again, without doing this, it's hard to wrap your head around it, but this is the way we have to do it, sadly. Okay, uh, particular note here, model predictive here, if we have a nonlinear process, and we could say this about other control schemes as well, and we have said it when we talked about uh, straight feedback or even cascade, if we have a nonlinear process, we might require some other type of uh, advanced strategy such as adaptive gain or gain scheduling or something like that uh, in order to compensate for that nonlinearity. Okay, so my point here, a nonlinear process may require adaptive gain for the feedback loop. The static model will not be effective, uh, affected, but the dynamic setting may be effective depending on the severity. So again, just trying to boil down the reading uh, for you a little bit. Okay, close to the end here, and really what all this reading boils down to kind of falls into the summary here, aside from a little bit of math. Feedforward reacts to prevent a disturbance rather than waiting until after this disturbance occurs, as feedback control would do. Feedforward requires feedback trim to prevent any offset between the process variable and the set point. Feed forward is used on slow processes subject to frequent and large disturbances or those processes that have a dynamic inverse response like steam drum level. Feed forward systems need to have an auto manual transfer option and a way to toggle the feed forward on and off and to do it in a bumpless way. And that's standard for everything. We want auto manual. We want to be able to switch the modes in and out of action uh, without having any type of you know, process upset or bumps. Feed forward compensation and model predictive systems have very similar tuning methods. The end result should produce a small but equal deviation above and below the set point during load disturbance. So probably not the easiest ILM to start out with, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of what's involved in fourth year. Um, there's, it's, there's a lot of theoretical stuff in fourth year. Um, you're expected at this point to be able to put a lot of the big pictures together. Um, so there's a lot of information for us to go through. My job hopefully uh, is to boil it down into stuff that is more relevant to our work rather than that of uh, a process engineer, for example. So that's it for the first ILM. I need to 
save there. That gets us back to here. How do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. There you go. Holy moly, started out with seven and we're down to six. We lost everybody. That is the end of this recording.